Welcome to the Dr. Berkson's Best Health radio show. That's the emphasis. It's on best health. So how in the world do you do it when we can't even trust who are our experts and what are we getting when we walk in the door? I I followed a doctor I really love to an HMO uh, this last year or two, and I was really interested to see what their well woman physical would be like. And And all they did was a pap smear in my blood pressure and ask me how I was doing. And that was it. That was it. They didn't look at my blood sugar. They didn't look at my cholesterol, but I was doing great. So, you know, best health isn't that easy to get, even from the people who are delivering it. So we have on this show conversations that you can get in on. Maybe you're in a bathtub. Some people write me that they listen to the show while they take a bath every morning, or you're walking around a lake, or you're just had a fight with your hubby in the kitchen, and now you're hiding in the office, but you want to get in on these conversations that help in the complete labyrinth of confusion that we have. And one of the things that's so important for health, the mothership of health, is the gut. There's no getting around it. I just lectured for A4M last weekend And the entire lecture was on the microbiome. And there were psychiatrists who had laboratories linking the gut to the brain. There were dermatologists that showed that 50% of people with rosacea, with um, a lot of pinkness on their cheeks, but it's definitely a problem. It's not just pink, healthy looking cheeks would go away if they treated gut infections. And there was a link with preventing and treating Alzheimer's, if they did fecal transplants, they gave people who had no more cognition, somebody else's fecal material in their biome, and they were reversing, in some cases, Alzheimer's disease. That is the power of the gut. So we need to have doctors on this show who know about the gut, and that's what we have today on this show. Hopefully, I will pronounce his name right. He is in Bozeman, Montana, because he's escaped from Chi-Town. I am also from Chicago, and the violence got so bad that he's ended up practicing family medicine with an emphasis on the gut in Bozeman, Montana. So on the show today, we have Peter Kozlowski, and I'm going to call him Dr. Koz, because that's a lot easier than the polysyllabic path for definite trouble. And he has written a book. I love the name of this book. Thank you. It's called Unfunk Your Gut, Boost Your Immune System, Heal Your Gut, and Unlock Your Mental, Emotional, Spiritual Health. That means he's looking at the gut in a mind, body, spirit, which, of course, you all know I wrote one of the very first books of the mind, body, spirit, gut 25 years ago, published by Wiley, called Healthy Digestion the Natural Way. And he, Dr. Kaz, has now taken this many steps further. So ex-Chicagoan, family practice, functional doc, Bozeman, Montana. Welcome to the show, Dr. Kaz. It's such an honor. Thank you so much. And, Tell- and thank you. I'm, I'm so thankful to um, practitioners like you that took such a chance so many years ago to follow this natural route that ever gave me a chance to have a career in this. And, and I mean, it was difficult for me to get into it 10 years ago, just with the the stigma and around my traditional colleagues, but I can't even imagine what it was like for you. And so I'm, I'm grateful for leaders like you that, that took the risk of pursuing something different. Well, thank you for saying that, you know, it's really crazy how things that are common sense, when when most people hear about this, they say that makes a lot of sense, but it's not necessarily um, put into the clinical arena. So tell us how you got from classical medicine to functional medicine, and how is it that you focused on the gut and then wrote a book on the gut? Sure. Um, Total random luck is how I got into (laughs) functional medicine. Um, I would have never, that was not my goal. I mean, I went through medical school. I got into residency, had no thoughts of anything alternative. I was just like, 
give me what the pharmaceutical companies say, give me the evidence-based data that they're putting out, and I'm going to follow that. Um, the way that it happened is it's my own personal story. So my own personal story is I'm in recovery from addiction from alcohol. And so, and that started with, so I'm a first generation American. My parents are from Poland and they were both doctors when they left Poland. Um, so medicine was always kind of like in my family, my grandpa, aunts, there's, there's a bunch of doctors in my family. Um, but growing up first generation American, my parents worked all the time, seven days a week, um, morning to night, pretty much. And I was kind of left to figure out the world on my own. And what happened to me is just extreme, like insecurity and wanting to fit in. And, um, I never felt like I fit in like my friends always, like I'd go to their houses and they'd be eating pizza and burgers. And at my house we would be eating like traditional Polish food. And I just always felt different. People, friends would come over to my house. People were speaking, Pol my parents were speaking Polish. Like it was always awkward for me. My solution to that at a very young age was alcohol. Like alcohol took away all my inhibitions and all my insecurities. And so that I got started on like binge drinking from a very young age. When I finally got into residency, I tried to stop. And I realized that I had, I couldn't, I didn't know how to manage life without alcohol. Um, I wasn't like a daily drinker or anything like that, but I just like on the weekends or whatever. And, but getting it out of my life, I, I was extremely unhappy. And it came to the point where I took a break for six weeks from residency to go to an inpatient treatment program uh, that was for professionals. And that, that was obviously a shock on a lot of levels, but everybody there was doctors, lawyers, business people, professionals, not like what I considered like an alcoholic. Um, so I, I definitely fit into the there and inpatient treatment was basically about mental, emotional, spiritual health, right? It was group therapy all morning. Then it was things like meditation, yoga, exercise, acupuncture in the afternoons. This was a whole new world to me. I had never experienced anything like that. Um, and it made me open-minded. And it, I learned that, I mean, when I went in there, I thought I was perfect. I was like your classic ego-based traditional doctor, um, would not listen to anybody or anything. Like I thought I had the world figured out and it was an extremely humbling experience to figure out that I had, it was kind of like the opposite of what I thought I was. Um, but it, it just made me open minded like, wow, there's all these things that people can do for their health that. Um, I never even would have considered. So when I got back to residency, um, as a family medicine resident, you do different rotations. So one month you're in cardiology, one month you're in outpatient, inpatient, OBGYN, you're always doing something different and you're always learning from different doctors. And we had a doctor that would work on our inpatient service for hospitalized patients that every time his week would start, he'd start everybody on a multivitamin and vitamin D. And we used to make fun of him and laugh as residents because we're like, why is he make, like wasting our time with starting like a multivitamin and vitamin D? Like we need to put in real orders for meds. And uh, so it was, it was like a running joke. And so one day it was like 2 a.m. on a Sunday night. We were on call together, Dr. Batra and I. And I just kind of asked him, I was like, Dr. Batra, why are you weird? Like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm studying something called functional medicine. And I asked him about it. He took, he took me to the website and he's what like, website? Hey, what website? IFM. IFM. Oh, IFM. okay. Org. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> and he showed it to me and he's like, it's basically like trying to figure out why people are sick. And I was like, that, that sounds interesting. And as a resident, they require you, and but they also pay for you to go to CME. So you go to conferences. So I signed up because I didn't know what else to, that I wanted to learn. And within the first hour of the first lecture, like I knew that I could never look at medicine the same. It like I kind of went into it thinking that this was going to be like just kind of full of crap, but it was not. It was all based on like anatomy I had learned, biochemistry I had learned, physiology I had learned. I was like just blown away. And 
the other thing at the, that week long conference was I was meeting professionals that, I mean, I was, I was very, I was probably the youngest one there as far as in career. I mean, I was still a resident in, or an intern in residency, but there was all these established surgeons and neurologists and all these uh, family practice doctors that were all there. And I was like, what are you guys doing here? Like, why are you here? Like your careers are kind of already fine. And they're like, this is the future of medicine. Like if you're just getting started, this is what you need to do. So I left it that, and I kind of talked to my residency coordinator and I was really lucky that my residency coordinator was extremely um, supportive in my pursuit of functional medicine. So I kept throughout residency doing conferences I got to do um, away rotations. So they let me leave my residency program for like months at a time. And so I went to Dr. Susan Blum's clinic in New York. I went to Dr. Hyman's clinic in, in Lenox, Massachusetts. I went to Dr. Chopra's center in Carlsbad. And I got to just follow the doctors around and just ask questions and sit in on the visits. And I still have like notepads, endless notepads of every everything I was hearing was new. It was everything was different. And I wasn't just following the, the doctors. I was following nutritionists, life coach, health coaches, uh, the receptionists, everybody there. Cause everybody there was kind of teaching me something. And I finished residency and went off into practice kind of in my, on my own. And, and since then it's been kind of trial and error. And I learned a lot from my patients over the years coming from a very traditional background. Um, a lot of my patients had been into holistic or alternative medicine for a lot longer than me. So, I mean, I, I was always willing to learn what people were doing. Um, you know, I got comfortable with the testing and from to the, like kind of the last part of your question about like, why focus on gut health? That's kind of, um, just ingrained in you over and over during functional medicine training, always start with the gut, start with the gut, start with the gut. Like, how do you do that? How do you start with, on your intake? What do you ask your patient? What guides you to figure out what's going on with the patient's gut and what maybe tests do you run uh, for your patients so we can get an idea of hands-on what you do? So my intake paperwork I use for my FM and it's about 40 pages. Um, and the patients fill that out. They send it back to me. I look at it before the visit. It includes a full medical history, a huge review of symptoms. A lot of them focused on the gut. We ask about birth history. We ask about childhood. We ask the number of times people have had antibiotics. Um, it asks about stress, environmental exposures. Um, so I have a pretty detailed um, idea when, when someone comes in. The most common condition I treat is SIBO. So that is the most prevalent thing that I see. That's kind of the, the, the worst. Um, oh, that good. I'm gonna, I, good. That's going to help me know what questions to ask you in a little bit. Good, good. <laughs> so it's, yeah. So for that, we're doing a two hour breath test. Who do you use? What company do you use for the breath test? Genova. Okay. Yeah. And I do stool testing. So it, it, I mean, as people are aware, there's a lot of costs that go into functional medicine testing. So I always try to prioritize if, if I think somebody has SIBO, I'm definitely starting with SIBO. Um, if that's like one, if they can only order one test and we suspect they have SIBO, that's what I'm going to start with. What are your biggest symptoms that make you suspect that? The easy ones are bloating, um, they notice they, they feel worse after eating foods high in fibers or sugars that are basically feeding the microbiome. Um, const, it's any of the IBS symptoms, basically. It could be constipation. It could be abdominal pain. Um, but the interesting thing that I've learned is I've had a, a number of patients over the years that don't have any gut symptoms and they just have eczema, right? I had one lady that had canker sores and we tried everything and we weren't getting anywhere. And I was like, let's just test you for SIBO. And this is what I mean by like trial and error. And she, it was positive without any gut symptoms at all. And we treated it and her canker sores went away. You know, that um, dermatologist that I mentioned that it was at the microbiome meeting last weekend, he found that he could reduce 50% of cases of rosacea if he treated SIBO in those patients. 
I always tell my patients, your skin is your best representation of your gut. So that's another sign. Like if somebody's coming in with any kind of chronic skin condition, I'm going to be looking at their gut. Um, so though, and then, yeah, the, the dietary things. So things like if they're reacting to avocados, apples, garlic, onions, um, that's an easy sign if they've just got really bad bloating after every time after eating. So those, like, I guess, classic IBS symptoms, um, it, then I, I mean, if somebody wants to do the full gamut, which in my opinion also includes the stool analysis, which looks at your microbiome. And who do you use for that? Doctor's data, sometimes Genova, but mostly doctor's data. Um, and then the third test that I like to do for gut health is the organic acids test, the oat from Great Plains lab. Um, I've found, I mean, one of the more common things behind SIBO is candida overgrowth and candida is kind of hard to catch. Um, we culture for it in the stool, but it, it, it tends to die in the stool. In my experience, I really like doctor's data because for whatever reason, their lab seems to catch candida more frequently than other ones I've seen. Um, but it tends to die in the stool. So there's a marker in the organic acids test that's called a ribinose that if that's elevated, that's another marker of candida. So if someone shows up positive on the stool, the urine or, or both, I'm going to treat them for candida. The organic acid test advantages is it also looks at mitochondrial function. It looks at neurotransmitters, fatty acid oxidation, some of your vitamin levels, glutathione levels. So you get kind of a, a bigger body picture with the oat as well. But th those are my three go-tos. So do you ever test the, um, and culture the sinuses because it's dripping on down? Do you do, and which company do you use for that? So I, I haven't done that. Um, no, it's very, I, I, in, yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's kind of my new, you know, you go the new galaxy, the next galaxy, it's in sinuses. Right. right? Yeah. Just a thought. So what are the kind of treatments, you know, there's the difference between rifaximin, the standard of care. Mm -hmm. And then the herbs, yeah. you know, biotics and um, metagenics both have yep. products. So how do you, how do you treat? So when someone does a two hour breath test there, they can either be positive for hydrogen, for methane gas. So these are gases, hydrogen gas, methane gas, or both. And in my practice, at least I'd say over 90% of people around 90% are methane positive or both. I very rarely have hydrogen, just straight hydrogen positive. I always get excited because that to me is a, usually a lot easier to treat. Um, and so rifaximin in my experience will frequently work for hydrogen positive. It's not my experience that it works very well for methane positive. And so this is the overwhelming majority of my patients and so with, I'm usually same thing. I use biotics research. Um, I use metagenics. Um, I will typically recommend the herbal treatment, but I like to go over the, the benefits and negatives of both. So rifaximin is, can be way faster, right? Two weeks. Whereas like with the natural approach, I'm usually doing nine weeks. Um, negative is rifaximin is like 2000 bucks. If your insurance doesn't want to pay for it. Um, the herbs are nine weeks. Uh, it, typically, I mean, everybody varies is, is an important thing to understand about SIBO too, is that every patient is different. Um, and then the nuclear option that I, or I call the nuclear option is an elemental diet, um, which is a liquid diet for anywhere from 14 to 21 days. The elemental powder has proteins, carbs, fats in it to kind of keep you going. Um, I've had less than a handful of patients that are like, just wanted to start with that. Um, it's obviously very difficult to not eat for two or three weeks for most people. So that's why I don't like to go with that option. And why but do you do I, that treatment? Why do you, why do you do that? What's your thinking behind that? So your gut bacteria are alive, right? And they ferment fibers and sugars. So if they don't eat, they die just like us. So if you don't eat for two or three weeks, the bacteria have nothing to feed off of. So they, they go away. Um, that that's 
in my opinion, like the mechanism of action of why it works. And my success rate is really high. I mean, when people, it, it's always basically like it's most of the time it's, we've tried antibiotics or we've tried herbs more than once. And then I'm like, finally, like if they're still suffering, okay, let's do this liquid diet. And that usually can get them over the hump. What's the name of the brand or the company that you use for the liquid diet? Integrative therapeutics. They're an elemental powder. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never done that. I've never had someone do that before. That's interesting. It's not easy. It, I mean, some people might look at it and be like, oh, yeah, I can do that. But for the majority of people, it's it's not easy to um, just completely cut out food for a few weeks. When I was young, I went to India. When the Beatles came back for the Maharishi and and it was meditation was a big deal, I hightailed it over to India to find out what this was all about and studied Ayurvedic medicine and this and that. When I, I got really sick and I didn't believe in medication, so mm -hmm. I came home and I fasted for 30 days on water to get rid of all the parasites and get rid of mm -hmm. everything. And I'm such a DES daughter. I have such obesogenic genes. I think I only lost like 11 pounds. I just wow. did. I didn't lose anything even from not eating, but it was, it was extraordinary. It was very difficult, but I yeah. did it at a, at a fasting center. And um, then that, because how you eat afterward is the big deal. Right. And that you have to be so, so that was controlled, but boy, that was an experience. And I remember the whole time I was going through it saying, I'm never going to do this again. <laughs> <laughs> See, exactly. So you're someone that's actually done it. I mean, I, I can't even say that I've done it. I don't really, I hope it never comes to the point that I need to, but I mean, I've done a week long juice fast, but um, it's, it's like exactly your experience. It, you don't, it's not something I'm not like telling everybody to do it. Cause they're going to hate me. <laughs> So, you know, there's a new, so there's hydrogen SIBO yep. and then there is methane SIBO. Now I had Dr. Rabar, who I lecture with on this show. He's an iconic functional gastroenterologist from LA and he, I use his test. He took a while to standardize his SIBO test. Um, he talks about there being like, he has multiple types of SIBO and most most of them are methane formers of some kind. And he says that that's a flashing red light. If someone is a methane SIBO patient, that they have stealth infections, hidden infections and issues. It's like, it's like the first presentation to the world that you've got it, but you've got stuff backstage. You've got mm -hmm. issues backstage. Do you find that to be true? Um, it's definitely the big thing about SIBO testing is, is that you don't know what's growing in there, right? You just know it is, or it either is or isn't. So in, in regards to, you know, that I'm, I try to stay very objective with the tests I'm comfortable with. So I kind of, I tell people, I'm like, listen, if we kind of want to get a better idea of what might be overgrowing your small intestine, let's also do a stool analysis with parasitology because we can assume we don't know for sure, but whatever's growing in your large intestine, there's a decent chance that that's what moved into your small intestine. Um, but it's, it's rough. I mean, methane positive SIBO, which the, the majority rough. of cases are is really difficult. I mean, it, people are very sick usually with systemic issues and then it's very hard to get rid of. Do you see, so there's a new kid coming down the block for SIBO, the hydrogen sulfide form of SIBO. I don't know. What do you, have comments on that? I don't know if I'm enough of an expert on that to, to comment yet. So I will defer to experts on I that. I don't know if uh, anybody is. It's kind of a yeah. newer thing. I, I asked right. Dr. Rabar and he said he yeah. might have it next year as part of his SIBO testing, but he said it, there was a clinical presentation and it's most often if people too don't clear up from what you know is, is a good intervention. You know, it's hard when you do everything you know to do for somebody and they come back and they, they're not improved. That's my worst day. Mm -hmm. I hate when someone comes back in, I feel so badly. And then you, but you know, you have an hour or you have a set time with someone and they've got years of suffering. It's hard to always hit it on the head in that hour or in the next few weeks and months as you test them. But, right. um, 
So what are some of your more interesting stories? You must have some very interesting stories with identifying and clearing up SIBO in chronically ill people. Yeah, I think that the 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 most, I mean, the majority of patients that I work with are that have SIBO are coming in with gut symptoms. Um, and that, you know, those, those are not that classic, but the systemic ones, like the thing, like the canker sores that went away, the eczema go, that goes away, the acne that goes away, autoimmune disease that starts trending towards remission or going into remission. So it's seeing that, that expression or that I've had this comment a lot is like, when people come back and they're like, I thought you were crazy when you were talking about like treating my rheumatoid arthritis and my gut. And like, now I'm off my meds and I feel better. And they're like, I I can't believe it. I was like, and I'm like, I always joke. I'm like me either. Like it's, it's, but it it, it is, it's really, really awesome to see people who can heal from chronic diseases like that to um, go into remission. And my big passion that my book is all about. And in my opinion, the secret to gut health is our mental, emotional, spiritual health. And me as a perfectionist, um, I only think about the patients that don't get better. And in my, and so I, that's where my, I would always think, and that was kind of the point of my book, like what's going on here. And to me, it's basically like your vagus nerve, your sympathetic versus parasympathetic nervous system trauma from childhood, um, trauma from current relationships or other things or work that basically when you activate your sympathetic nervous system, you are shunting blood away from your brain and muscles, or excuse me, away from your gut to your brain and muscles to escape, right? The analogy I use now is like living in Montana. If I'm hiking in the mountains and I see a grizzly bear, I, my sympathetic nervous system should be activated. And I, run away. When I'm sitting by the campfire, if I survived at the end of the night and I'm having a s'more, the rest and digest is activated and I digest my food. People nowadays are living as if they're running from a bear 24 seven, right? We wake up and I'm guilty of this. The first thing I do is check my phone, email, texts, um, the news, and my sympathetic nervous system is just firing. And then I have breakfast and I've got the news on, or I'm answering emails or something, sympathetic nervous system telling my gut, don't digest, shut down the stomach acid, shut down your good bacteria, allow bacteria to overgrow. Um, so that, that's kind of like, I guess my passion. I mean, I, and it probably started because of my own story of, of just being in recovery and learning the importance of mental health, but that's, to me, the biggest factor that I see in people that don't heal. And it, and it, a lot of times it's denial. Like people are, will follow whatever diet supplements testing. I tell them, but when I ask them to like peel back the layers of the onion and go into childhood and go into things that happened, that's when the red flags go up. They're like, no, I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to go there. This is not an issue. And as someone who's like lived in denial for a long, you know, for a long time, like you can kind of spot people that are in that same spot. And I always warn my patients. I'm like, listen, I promise you, your SIBO is not going to go away if you don't work on your mental, emotional, spiritual health. Do you Another- guide them on how to do this or do you just tell them to go off? go off young man and do this or how, how do you, how do you guide? Cause sometimes I have, yeah. sometimes I bring it up and people are, the light goes off and they're grateful. Sometimes they go, you, this is not why I'm here. You're here because of physiology. You're not a psychotherapist. Yeah. I don't want to go there. And they get upset and they get chafed. So, right. um, yeah, all the time. <laughs> so how, what is it that you offer for them if you find that that's where they need to go that does it in an effective and successful win-win manner i think the 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 trick for you is is get addicted to like an alcohol or a drug and then recover from it and have a story of getting over that and then you kind of have like some street cred and you're kind of legit Shoot, i haven't been an alcoholic i've missed the boat <laughs> what the there, heck <laughs> there's other ways you can do it but uh yeah, I mean, it, 
that it's a, that's a great question and a great point. I, I also tell people, I'm like, this is the most important part of health, but it's the most difficult one for me to help you with. Right. And every patient I've ever met, I've recommended to get a therapist. Um, so I'm very pro therapy. They're not the answer to everything, but for me, at least they help me peel back the layers of the onion to uncover what, every, how everything started. Right. Um, I'm really trying to learn now more about heart rate variability because ah. that is a way to train your vagus nerve. And to me, it's kind of like the way I look at it, like the vagus nerve is the key to your gut health, because that's, what's carrying signals from your gut to your brain and back from your brain to your gut. And My newest book is on oxytocin. <laughs> oh, nice. So that, that is a great thing for people to explore. I do a gratitude list every day with my wife. I pray. Um, I have friends that are in recovery and it's not just from like alcohol or drugs, recovery from childhood trauma or other things. So building like a network, right. Or, or, or um, people that, you know, you can't do it alone. And that, that was probably like my biggest fault in trying to recover from my own issues is like, I've always wanted to do everything on my own and it's not, you can't do it on your own. You can't recover on your own and we am need I, help. Am I speaking to you in your office? Does any of this have to do with this bear that I see behind you in the corner? I see a big stuffed bear. It looks like almost five feet tall or something like that. Does that have anything to do with, are, are you in your doctor's office right now? It's my home office, home which is office? frequently my doctor's office now. Okay. So what is, is that bear have something to do with what we're discussing? That's Wilson. His name's Wilson. Um, <laughs> I like a basketball. He... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of grizzly bears in Montana. So we've kind of just taken an interest in them and uh, they're, they're just a very Montana thing. So oh, okay. we, we, we were walking down main street in Bozeman and there was a gift shop and they had all these uh, bears. So I had, to, I walked out with one. <laughs> I bet your patients comment on this big bear in your office. Yeah. He's, he's, tall. He's, he's promoting my book too. He's, my <laughs> he's book got his, he's holding your book close to his heart, mind you. <laughs> and he's also wearing a t-shirt with like my logo, um, which is actually on the back of that shirt. It says we put the funk in functional medicine, which is kind of where the title of my book on funk your gut came from was okay. putting the funk in functional <laughs> medicine. So I like that. Wilson, the bear represents all those things. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> you, that is very cool. So, um, so do you believe, so I once, when I was writing healthy digestion, the natural way, I bumped into this study that stuck with me and it helps me guide my patients about this flashing red light about gut health. So this study was quite extraordinary and it was done where they took really healthy women uh -huh. And they aspirated their nipples. So they squeezed their nipples hard enough where they could get some healthy um, fluid out of their breast tissue. It wasn't an abnormal breast. They, and if you do that hard enough on any woman, you'll get a little aspirate that comes out. And mm -hmm. then they looked for healthy cells versus not healthy cells. And they compared this to how many times these women pooped a day. This was like, and they did it wow. on thousands of women. Wow. Well, I thought this study was quite extraordinary because what they found, Peter or Dr. Kaz, <laughs> <laughs> they found that women who pooped twice a day had no abnormal cells at all inside their breasts. And when women pooped once a day, they started to have a few abnormal cells, like 5% of the cells were abnormal. And then as they got more and more slower transit time, and more constipated. So, cause your hormones are, you make them, yeah. they work locally. You get rid of them through your poop. You make them, you use them, you poop them, you make them, you use them, poop them. It's got like this flashing neon light um, on a strip mall, make them, use them, poop them. And um, if you can't poop out your uh, hormonal waste, so to speak, then your right. hormones have a higher risk of going South. So once women were really severely constipated, they got up to 50% abnormal wow. cells, like going to the bathroom once a week. Wow. So I find I deal a lot with adjunctive nutritional care with breast cancer patients. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to them about their bowel history, most of them 
have had years of constipation, if not wow. presently. And I've noticed this link between that. So I tell my patients, you'll get a gold star when you're pooping twice a day and it looks and I go through yada, yada, yada. But I don't know if you'd ever, what do you guide people as the ideal amount to poop? And now you might probably find that study rather fascinating. Yeah, I can't wait to share that with my wife. She poops definitely twice a day and her hormones are great. So <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm excited to share that with her. Um, Exciting pooping pillow talk. <laughs> absolutely. Um, it, uh, <laughs> you're, <laughs> sorry. Well, you got it. You got to make it enjoyable, you know, because right. there's so much that's not enjoyable. If we want to learn, we want to make it with, we could say, I could drink to that. <laughs> I, I like the, the, the way to tell people is to poop a snake. I think from Dr. Terry Walls, she may have started that or, or maybe somebody before her. Um, so pooping a snake at least once a day, twice a day. Um, I'm, I mean, I, I'm really happy if they're at least going once a day um, and twice a day would be even better. Okay. Excellent. Um, so what are the other things that um, you use? Do you use stomach acid replacement and pancreatic enzyme replacement? And what do you look at for those? And how do you go about that? Because it's so important to yet a lot of people don't know about that. And certainly a lot of gastroenterologists would poo yeah. that. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, I'm a very, very big supporter of supporting digestion. And it goes back to my experience of being that for the majority of people, it usually started with mental, emotional, spiritual health. When that's activated, that shuts down your stomach for making acid. And if you're not making acid, then you're not digesting protein. You're not killing off bacteria. You're you mean not when absorbing. the sympathetic nervous system is activated, yeah. turn, that's what you meant. Okay. Yep. Okay. Sorry. You, when it's activated, you're not digesting and you're not making acid. So you're blocking all those crucial functions. And so I'm, I'm always testing and treating people for low stomach acid, especially if they have SIBO. My the test that actually has been pretty reliable for me, at least as a screening test is the baking soda test. I don't know. Do you ever use that? No. How do you do that? It, it sounded ridiculous. Like when I heard about this, I was like, this has got to be a joke. It, it sounds like a high school chemistry experiment. You mix a quarter teaspoon of baking soda into a few ounces of water, mix it up and drink it on an empty stomach. Baking soda is basic. Your stomach should be acidic. When the base and the acid meet, it creates an explosion, which presents as gas and you should start burping. So somebody should burp within three minutes and we tell them to time up to five minutes after drinking the baking soda. If they don't burp, then they probably have low stomach acid. And then the, the treatment and the other way that I use is to support betaine HCL. So hydrochloric acid supplement. The most important thing about that is that you only take it when you're eating protein. So I tell people like meat, fish, eggs. Um, you know, you there's take... a study, I write about it in healthy digestion where people didn't get the benefit of herbs because they didn't have stomach acid. So it gets confusing because you, are, there is a little bit of protein and you do need to break down um, even fiber in vegetables a little bit with acid. So it is confusing as exactly how to replace. I, yeah. So I think that the HCL just, it, it also activates your pancreatic enzymes, right? right. So if you're not making acid, then you're not, even if your pancreas is working great, you're not activating those pancreatic enzymes. So that's going to affect your ability to, to digest carbs and fats and things like that. Um, so I definitely use some, sometimes people are like, I don't want to take HCL. What else can I do to support my stomach acid? So I, apple cider vinegar, acupuncture, umabushi plums, which are fermented apricots before meals. Um, papaya can help, uh, Swedish bitters. So these are all alternatives to help the, the stomach make acid. Um, but we will supplement it. So it is, you take one and then you eat your meal, a normal reaction would be to have discomfort. 
if you take one and you don't feel anything or you feel better then you have low stomach acid because you put in acid, your stomach's not making enough and you're helping the digestive process. And so we have them titrate up every two days. You try going up until you get some symptoms of heartburn or discomfort, and then you cut back by one. Um, in the majority, I mean, it's a normal part of aging, low stomach acid, but I see it in kids, teenagers, young adults. And to me, the biggest way to turn that around is healing the trauma and oh, activating the parasympathetic nervous system. And when people ask me like, how long am I going to be on this HCL? I'm like, well, it depends on, um, you know, on your, to me, usually your mental, emotional, spiritual health. I've even seen it run in families and I, I don't know about a gene that codes for low stomach acid. My thought process as being a mental, emotional, spiritual health person is that there's a lot of unhealthy, um, behavior in the family. And that's why multiple people have the low acid. But in my old clinic in California, I had a Heidelberg gastric analysis machine and I ran oh, wow. that on thousands of patients. Mm -hmm. And that tells you exactly how much acid they make. Cause it's a challenge of the functionality uh -huh. of the cells, the parietal cells that make mm -hmm. stomach acid. And I also classically run a parietal cell antibody because okay. people yeah. can have autoimmune disease against yep. the cell that makes stomach acid. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things uh, that I, I lately, I teach the stomach acid section for A4M in the gastroenterology module. So it's been very interesting diving deeper and deeper into the science all the time. Um, but one of the things that I've learned is some very smart ENT physicians have discovered that pepsin mm -hmm. can aerosolize and it's very damaging to the fragile epithelial lining of the esophagus. And the only one study that ever took a look at efficacy of hydrochloric acid pills having pepsin added to them showed that it didn't synergize or make the hydrochloric acid any more effective. So I mm. teach to avoid um, pepsin in the stomach acid pills because I don't want them to get any upper airway issues and yada, yada, sure. yada, just some comments of that. And that's been something in the last eight, six, seven years since I've been teaching that, that's been interesting. And I, I designed Great. formulas for biotics. I used to fermentogenics and now I have wanted to come out with a, a, a line for the gut and one of the stomach acid products to not have that because it's very hard to find yeah. stomach acid that doesn't have pepsin because it's just one of those things that was the trend of the industry to yep. add it in. But now it looks like it might not be a good thing to add in. I don't know if you knew that, but it's kind of interesting because most functional docs I talk to and share with them that I've discovered this research, mm -hmm. especially from the ENT docs, because uh, yeah. they with very severe airway disease um, and uh, then they're pretty fascinated because most people haven't heard that. Yeah, that is really interesting. I mean, my goal with any of my gut treatments is to do things as short as possible. So it, I, I, I don't ever want somebody to be on anything like that long term. Um, so it, it's I always try to minimize the time frame, get people healthy, and then let them move on with their life and, and come off of supplements. Do you find that if they're on the stomach acid, they just start when the parietal cells on their own kick in, they start having symptoms. I find that patients have more symptoms and they slowly wean themselves off unless they're much old. If they've had a helicobacter pylori, a, a bacterial infection too long, you get irreversible damage of the parietal cells. So you might right. have some people that need it. And there's right. a problem with just doing as I'm right now doing, because I don't have a Heidelberg. I think the company closed down in the pandemic. We've been trying to buy another machine. And I think mm -hmm. that was one of the losses in the pandemic. But if you do the titration where you take a, a pill and then you do another one, which is what I'm doing now too with patients, you can miss atrophic gastritis patients. You can get a false pain from people who ha literally have damage that, so they need the stomach acid, but they'll hurt from it. So it's mm -hmm about a 90% self, the self challenge, it doesn't give you a perfect. So that's one of the limitations of it, which the Heidelberg analysis machine, the gastric analysis machine. I don't know if anyone's out there and listening, if you've got an extra Heidelberg gastric analysis machine stuck up in your attic. 
<laughs> we're looking to buy one at the Naples Center for Functional Medicine. <laughs> nice. Hopefully well, somebody listening has one. Well, this has been really great. Um, I just want to ask you a few more questions and we're going to be coming close to an end soon. And we really appreciate you giving this time and we really appreciate your new book, which we will have links to his new book in the show notes. If you go to drlindsayberkson.com, you can listen to the show there or you can listen to it on Spotify or iTunes or Google Play or Apple Play. It's kind of, and then we also now have a video channel. And so we have people listening on video. So we will put the link to the book Unfunk your gut, which comes from functional medicine to unfunk your gut and boost your immune system, heal your gut and unlock your mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Because you've heard now how important that is to Dr. Cause he sees you as a multi-bodied uh, human being. And that's really a lovely way to be seen um, by your physician. What a lucky thing your patients are that you're looking at them in body mind and spirit how if people want to get in touch with you what's the name of your clinic um doc cause so it's it's my website is doc-cause.com D -O -C how do you spell that okay doc-koz.com um that that has Did all you do the dash because somebody else had the doc cause before you no, actually, I when I first started, I, I just had it one word, Doc Cause. Yeah. But everybody was reading it as Doc Oz. So the oh. D O C K O Z. Everybody thought it was Doc Oz. So I had to put something to separate it because I'm not Dr. Oz. Um, so that, that that that's actually why. Are you seeing um, all your patients with telemedicine? So I, I work, I'm working with no. Um patients that are here in Bozeman, Montana, or when I'm back in Illinois, I work in office, but the majority of people now, yeah, we're working from uh, telemedicine. So I do offer in office visits. You, most of the time it's in Bozeman. Um, but virtually, I mean, I guess what, you know, the good thing is, is that um, our success rate hasn't gone down with patients and we're, we're, you know, a year and a half into this, um, we're still doing good. So it, telemedicine seems to work for what I do. So I just had on the inventor of telemedicine. And I he, saw that, yeah. he's a kidney doctor here in town who I worked with for quite a number of years. And he wanted to do dialysis on some patients in Giddings and he needed a way to do it. And at that time, all of the computer and everything was these huge cables. So he got an NIH grant and, um, worked with AT&T to set it up. And it was so, so I, the beginning of the pandemic, when everyone was zooming, I, I sent him an email. I said, Jack, you must feel so vindicated. Oh my God. And here you also, we all we're even using it, almost what he's set into motion with what we're doing with zoom. So thank you, Dr. Jack. He was, I was going to yeah. go see him tomorrow night. He's in a band, but because of we're having a stage five in Austin due to the Delta variant, the band is not playing. They banned oh, no. the band. <laughs> well, um, is there any final thing that you want to say? And everyone, don't forget if you love conversations like this, because, you know, it's not easy to get really smart people who address body, mind, and spirit and have spent a lot of time learning after med school or whatever school they went to, all that effort and time and money. It's a lot of effort. And even though when they graduate, they still are just out, they haven't used it like you do in some rotations. So, it's a constant learning process. These are functional medicine or practitioners are devoted. They really see the light, the root cause medicine, and they do everything they can. But it's it's not that easy to find some that are seasoned and know what they're doing or focus on the gut. I've had a number of cancer patients since I said I work with them. I might have cancer patients that have had four or five, maybe bouts of ovarian cancer, and no one's ever... And they've gone to see complementary oncologists, natural doctors, functional mm -hmm. doctors, and no one's run a gut test on them, a small intestine test on them. They have had chronic sinusitis in their history. No one's looked at their sinuses and seen what they can, what the biome is in there. And it, so it's, it, you never know who you're going to 
find, and it's a journey in life, just like it is to find a partner to find a physician. So anyway, we have this group, since I wasn't lecturing during the pandemic, I put together a membership and the higher level are docs and pharmacists and the middle level is really interested patients. And then there's another level where I'm posting all the time and I keep myself up to date. So if you at all are interested in this, don't forget to go to drlindsayberkson.com forward slash membership. And we're having a big party because this August will be one year that this membership is in um, existence. And we're going to invite a lot of people to come into this online telemedicine. Thank you, Dr. Jack. We're going to have yeah. a big party and we're going to invite you and your what lovely wife too. Okay, so thank you. any final words on what's some of the best things people can do to keep a healthy gut? Yeah. So I, I like keeping things simple. There is a ancient philosoph- philosopher that said, anxiety is worrying about the future. Depression is worrying about the past. So what's the treatment, the present moment. And to me, I think that that's one of the best ways we can get out of that sympathetic overdrive that people are living in. And we get back to what's going on in front of us in the present moment. And then your gut will heal. You'll probably, if you have issues, you need to find a functional medicine doctor that's experienced with working with things like SIBO, candida, dysbiosis. But I, I mean, in my opinion, that stuff is easy to get rid of when you can stay in the present moment, deal with the trauma, deal with the things that have happened to you. Um, the gut will heal. Well, that's beautifully said, although I just came up with another question, so I'm not going to end it here. I'm going to change my mind. I'm a woman and I hear me roar. Okay. (laughs) So you just mentioned Canada. You said that's not that difficult to heal. Of course, you meant it there in the present moment. Can you tell us a few of your secrets for treating candidiasis and then we will exit and say sayonara? I usually start with nystatin, a plus herbs usually. I mean, it's really easy, like on doctor's data testing, if they find it, they do sensitivity testing. So they're going to test what herbs, what um, antifungals will kill the species that's growing inside you. If we just have a positive test on an oat test, so we don't really, we don't have sensitivities. Nystatin, sometimes I'll use Diflucan if, if that's not working. I usually, while people are taking Nystatin, I like them to um, also be on a combination of three herbs. So I use things like caprylic acid, grapefruit seed extract, silver, uva ursi, berberine, things like that. So that those in combination, a soil-based probiotic at night, and then a form Meg, of a, is it megaspore? Is that what you use? Uh no, yes, yeah, sometimes. Um, there's different, I, I kind of alternate. Um so uh what is, I, I get, I got to think of the name. I'll, I'll follow up with you. I forget the one that, um, okay. Well, I'm just the reason I wanted to mention is, is so if the last conference spore therapy was the star of the show and it's hard to get. So if you are interested in spore therapy, you can go to my website, Dr. and I've got a place products we love. And this, I have a, a link for spore therapy. And I also have a link to get access to doctor's lines and get any product you want for a discount shipped to you for free. Because when you buy doctor's products on Amazon, for example, they might be sitting in a hot warehouse and they might not be tended to the way you would like those doctors. You don't know the quality, even though they're quality products, you don't know a lot about the back copy unless you get them from that company. So there's a middleman, just so you know, if you want to get this, you don't have to do it, but it's access for you because some of this access is hard to get, or you purchase it online thinking you're getting a good product, but it's been damaged by heat and you don't know it and you're not getting well. So. Awesome. So thank you for all that. Thank you for all that. Um, I remember being at a, at a talk by Dr. Crook talking Uh about yeast and candida and how he got into it and his first book on it. But, you know, it's all, it's, if you live long enough, you see the trends of all these things. But I remember that his story was um, that he had a patient that was, uh, psychologically unhinged and so ill. I mean, he was on, wasn't on the edge of committing suicide. And it turned out that he had multiple, multiple antibiotics and he had thrush on his tongue. And then he, when he treated him 
for an anti-candida protocol, then much of the body, mind, spirit became congruent and improved. And he said, boy, well, I didn't learn this in med school. I better take a look into this. You could have something growing. And that odd thing about candida is it it, it can grow hypha, it roots out. And, and that's why sometimes you don't catch it in a stool sample because it cling, it's a cling on. It can cling mm -hmm. onto the walls of your gut. But it's a good guy when it's not clinging on. So I guess we want it to be emotionally stable and not cling on to us. Okay. <laughs> so we've been talking about um, the gut and the health of the gut. And I have so much respect for physicians that do that. And um, so do you feel like you have a really healthy gut? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, I've tested it when I first, they give you a free stool test when you, when you go to your first conference at IFM and um, I had parasites and dysbiosis and, and fixed all of that. Um, and I'm on day three of an elimination diet right now. So I, I usually do an elimination diet once a year um, and check in on any food sensitivities. So I think my gut's in good shape. I think it's been unfunked. I love that. So what do you think is like the, when you see this number one bacteria in a comprehensive stool, you say, oh my God, this person's really, this is serious bacteria. Which one would that be for you? To me, the worst is SIBO, which we, we don't know. Um, but I mean, they, they can all cause problems. I don't know that I have like a specific one that I think is worse than all the others. Overall, I just think that SIBO is by far the worst thing going on in your gut because you can never heal your large intestine if you don't address the issue in the small intestine. So that that has to be addressed first in my experience. So does that mean if you have a really seriously ill patient, even without any gut issues, you're going to go ahead and test them for SIBO anyway? Sometimes. Um, a lot of time I do a lot with toxins. So I work a lot with mold and heavy metals. Oh, okay. um, so hormones, um, diet. So the majority of time I'm starting with the gut, but there's depending on someone's exposure history and other things, a lot of times we're starting with other, you know, with something like toxins. It's interesting. I work in Naples one week a month and they eat a lot of fish there. And uh -huh. the fish, so people, I've now started running blood levels, which is your current exposure of arsenic, cadmium, and mercury, not just mercury. Yeah. And people are sky high and their gut is ruined and their hormones are ruined. They're taking hormone replacement and they can't respond. It's so interesting that wonder, fish is a wonderful food and humanity has ruined it. It's yeah. Just, like a lot of things. I um, know. I know. That, that's like what I always uh, say or how I start my gut talks is Hippocrates 3000 years ago said all disease begins in the gut. And basically since he said that everything we've done is destroy the gut. So antibiotics and stress and our food supply and toxins, like he figured this out without any kind of testing or anything like he, he's just amazing, but we've literally done everything in the opposite direction of that since then. So that's why we have these kind of conversations so people can hear some take homes so they can slowly start unraveling some of the damage that's been done. Of course, some of it's at the sperm and egg and in utero level, but people are feel so empowered when they read a book like yours, listen to your story, hear how you practice, they get a glimmer of hope. So don't Thank forget you. the one thing is, you know, your gut can heal. Absolutely. Always. And it usually responds pretty quickly. If you got a smart doctor like Dr. Cause who can identify what's wrong, not often, it's not always on the first try, but that's yeah. the way to go. So thank you so much for being on the show. It was an honor. Thank you. You were, you're a very good speaker. You have such a lovely voice and your mic is so good. It's I felt like this was a really, we had lots of good radio moments. I think you're very, you're very good presence. You feel grounded. You feel yeah. like your body, mind, and spirit are centered. So you've done a lot of work on yourself and I guess you pass that forward. Trying to, it's a <laughs> daily process. Well, I met your wife just before we came on the air and she looks like a beautiful spouse and so it she seems is. like you got a great life in Bozeman. I hope you, it's very successful and that your book is successful and we appreciate that you've shared your wisdom with our tribe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao, ciao.